Hey, good afternoon. I'm Scott Elliott. I'm the Artistic Director of The New Group, and welcome to our Why We Do It conversation series, where uh, in this crazy, tumultuous time, uh, I get to check in once a week with uh, one of our artists. Um, a couple of little reminders. We have our reading, our benefit reading of The Jacksonian coming up. That's Beth Henley's play. That was such a great great production by Bob Falls. And we'll have Bill Pullman and Amy Madigan and Ed Harris and Juliet Brett and Carol Kane coming up to join us. And uh, so get your tickets at our website. Come check it out. We did the spoils last week. That was great. And uh, I think this one's going to be amazing also. So come join us. And then I'm just going to just do a little pitch right now because, of course, the new group's a not-for-profit theater. And we survive on donations. So if you happen to be sitting on any extra cash, please donate. Every little bit helps. Uh, and it's going to help us get through um, this crazy time where, uh, you know, we're doing all sorts of nutty, making all sorts of nutty art behind the scenes. But when we open our, you know, our stages again, it will be with a, a musical that we were supposed to actually be starting rehearsals for uh, like next week. Um, and that's called Black No More, which is um, a musical by uh, Tariq Trotter uh, and John Ridley. Tariq Trotter is Black Thought of the Roots and John Ridley, the great writer, director. And uh, Bill T. Jones is the choreographer and the star of the show is today's guest, Brandon Victor Dixon. Brandon. Hello. How you doing? I'm well, how are you? Yeah, good, good. I was just thinking because you know, I, I, you know, my, my, I, it just occurred to me actually. I was just as I was just saying that announcement that we would have been starting our, our big, uh, our big project that we met on and and began our friendship on in a week. Yeah, uh, it was. It would have been that imminent. Would have been that imminent. Uh, we might not have been meeting this way because we probably would have already been. Uh, you know, doing some workshopping or something like that. But uh, yeah, that um, that project is how we met. And and you know, I I have to say that um, you know my you know my my friendship and love of you, uh, you know, really was birthed out of out of our our collaboration and how how we work together. As as it often is in these uh, in these relationships, you know, you get with people and you gravitate toward them and. You know, I was completely and utterly knocked out by you, not just because of your talent, but just because of your generosity of spirit and the way that you, you know, as a director, you 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 put somebody in the star as the lead in a show, and really, truthfully, that's what that's how the um, experience is. It's based on that person, and like what you brought to the experience from the very first reading that we did uh, was no, but but that was the tone that was set for you know for the room, and uh, and my trust in you just was just it just grew so much, and of course we did eighty we've done like it feels like eighty million workshops since then, but um but that's that's the thing that I mean of course everybody knows how brilliantly talented you are, but I I don't know that everybody knows what goes on behind the scenes with you and how how collaborative and wonderful and I mean aside from taking direction but just the way that you lead a room so so just tell let's talk a little bit about that and like how, how did you develop like where you know tell tell it because it's always good to sort of figure out like how you got into this business and and how you developed into the man you are um well thank you for all of that um I would say the reason I bought it I was like, you know, I, I imagine that because you take on different roles and different shows at different point, parts, points in time in your life, you are probably sometimes you're better or you're less yourself, um, which means that might have affected the how that pro process went, you know, some, even that time when, I'm, when I was my lesser self. So I was like, ooh. <laughs> um, oh, I, I doubt <laughs> it, but keep going. I've never heard that, but keep going. Um, but you know, I mean, so, well, so for, for me, you know, it was a very natural process. You know, I, I went to schools that had understood the crucial importance of arts education. So like it was a, a natural part of my curriculum. I had a music class every day. Um, we did three musicals a year, you know, first through eighth grade. In seventh and eighth grade, we always did a Shakespeare play in addition to that. Um, I went to school in D.C. at a place that was primarily academically and athletically oriented, but it was a small school, you know, like 75 students per grade, and it was in D.C. So there were arts opportunities for me to 
participate in. And my my mom would, you know, get me to camps in the summer if I wanted to do a program at like Duke Ellington. Um, and my teachers at that school recognized my aptitude and they would steer me towards scholarships. So I got to study in Oxford. Um, and and so that, you know, this is how I, I kind of picked up my training and my um, and I think the practice of doing a lot of shows, performing a lot, performing from people also from a young age, um, you know, there's a part of my craft that is academic and technical, and then there's another part that's very experiential and very much about awareness, just because after you do it so many times, you start to recognize certain things about environments. Um, so I think that's kind of honed how I've, how I gravitate towards material and the creation of work. Um, but I've also oh, I've also been like alone in my pursuit of it a lot. So I also think whatever is present or whatever happens has been kind of driven by me. So I've always felt a need to drive into whatever the things are. Um, and you know, as I as I you know I went to college and you know started doing shows, I've been really very fortunate. I've worked with wonderful artists who were both masters of their craft, but also um, generous collaborators, because all masters know that you have to be gener a generous collaborator, specific, particularly in theater. Um, and I've also, you know, like my first professional experience was uh, was originating Simba in the Cheetah Company of the Lion King in Chicago. I, I left college early to go do it. Um, and I've always had a natural aptitude for performance. <clears throat> And when I got this show, I struggled a great deal. It was the first time I'd ever struggled in, in performing. And, and it was a very hard experience for me. But I was so thoroughly supported by the family of cast members and creatives that taught me and put me in the show. I mean, so tremendously supported to the point where I, I, had, I, had, I had to kind of give in. You know, like, you know when you, you're struggling with things and you fight to hold on, but eventually you have to kind of succumb in what order to rise up. what was the struggle creative or, or? Uh, no, it was a, it was a so vocal so the song endless night the main song that simba sings when i auditioned for the show uh i would i remember my first audition with uh, mark bender uh congratulations on your on your uh uh, uh your, your retirement sir um that uh i went in there and um and I, I sang the song great the first time. He gave me some notes. I sang it the second time, and I cracked. I was always very 50-50 on this song. I never should have gotten the job, Scott. Never should have gotten the job. <laughs> um, but I, I, you know, even, like, my, my next audition in front of, like, the collection, it was 10 a.m., which is a cruel time to audition to Simba. And I was in there, and I couldn't finish the song. Couldn't get through it without cracking. Uh, Colin Firth was the the supervisor musical supervisor at the time he got up he moved the accompanist away from the piano he told me to come to the piano let's sing it together or I mean, couldn't get through it couldn't get through it they were like don't worry about it let's do the scenes did the scenes the next day kevin kennison who worked for disney at the time he called me and he was like don't worry about earlier it's okay come back tomorrow and i came back the next day and i sang and i sounded great you know so like eventually i got the job but i never i knew i could do it but i didn't trust that i could do it every time I had to, eight times a week. I'd only ever done a show three times time. <laughs> right. You know, like it's like, with the, you train for two months, you do a show for a weekend, you're done. So it was a very, very new circumstance. And also, it, so now I'm in this, this this place and I'm also used to like working out the, the kinks in secret and then revealing my brilliant stuff. Um, but you know, you, you get there and you can't do that. You're in a big old ballroom to rehearse there's the director, the associate director, the assistant director, uh, the choreo, the, the the interns, the people working on puppets in the corner, the dancers stretching over there while you go over your thing by the piano with the MD. And so then you have anxiety. And so it just created a very challenging emotional and psychological experience for me um, that eventually I overcame and I triumphed, but not without the thorough support of those individuals. And so, you know, from the outset, professionally, I understood that theater is a family. It requires, and it requires that. And then my, my, it requires that level of support to succeed. And then my next show, you know, The Color Purple, which was written from scratch, gave me an even, even deeper insight into the necessity for collaboration, 
the best idea wins. How do you how do you show up in the room, understand how this thing can work its best and what's the best way you can show up into it in order for it to be that? Sometimes that's for you to be in the front. Sometimes that's for you to be in the back. Sometimes that's for you to be on the side. But like every time I get into a creative experience, it's like, all right, what? how can I envision achieving our, our best self for this project? And then how can I best support that? And, you know, and where, where can I fill in? Well, that's a, that's a, that's so interesting, you know, it, and it, it, it definitely is who you are, you know, like that's the, that's the sort of fun thing about working with you is that you do sort of locate where there's need and, and sort of sprinkle a little of your magic in there. And that's, uh, that's been the fun part of, you know, cause obviously we've done these workshops with different people. You know, like, you know, you're, you've been a constant, you, Tamika, you know, a few people have been a constant, but there's been all sorts of people coming in and out. And so, yeah, it's been interesting sort of watching you operate like that. Um, so, so when you, when you finished The Lion King, how, how long, so oh, wait a minute, just, just going back to that. So, so you just worked it out. Like you like exercised, you worked your voice out and you got the song. And then, and then your life, or was you, were you, were you terrorized? Like every time you got to that note, I mean, what, what was the, so, I mean, curious, it was carried on that story. It was, it was, it was a process through building the show. Um, you know, eventually we, I made progress. I started, that's where I started my most earnest meditation process, practice, I started my meditation practice during that time. Mm -hmm. um, I was running three miles a day, just trying to like get warm, trying to, um, and, so I made, you know, I made triumphs, you know, the, the day when we, cause we'd rehearsed everything and we're putting it all together in the rehearsal room. So everybody's all right, everybody's going to be present. So we, and I sang it that day and I sounded great. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's like, so it's like, that was a, a good day. I, I had a, but you know, what ended up happening is that as we got to the theater and we got into tech and previews again, you know, they had given me a, a voice teacher, Bob Johnson, and I mean, I tell you, Scott, I thought I was like, I know they're training Simba's in secret. I know that I was like, I was like, I know they're not going to let me go on. I was like, why would you let me go on um, unless I get this together? And, you know, I would. And what ended up happening is that coming into uh, going into the previews, you know, the director sat me down and he was like, you know, I mean, the music music supervisor He's like, hey, you know, um, we we want, we can tell that you're thinking about this now, not just in the scene, but in all of your scenes. So we're, we're, we're going to take this down a half a step. Don't feel bad. We're doing down a half a step on Broadway. It's not a problem. We're going to take this down a half a step because we don't want you thinking about it. <clears throat> and they were like, because the weird thing is you sing even higher notes in some of the other songs. So it's just, there's something about this song. So they took it down um, and I did relax. And, you know, we started started previews, all good, great performances. Then Julie, Tamar, and Lebo M come to town with the Disney team. And we have a meeting. And Lebo's like, I think you sound great, but I think we can take it back up. Because I think it sounds, I think, so we have a, a music session. There's like 30 people in the room. I'm like, At this point, I'm, I'm like, whatever. Right. So I sit and he's like, you sound great. He's just, just you know, you should be more free with it. Let it go where it's okay, fine. Next day, next night, I sing it and the show because they took it up. Sound great. The next night, I sound good. The night after that, not great. The next preview, bad. And so I can see as I leave the 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 as I leave the theater that night, I see that I'm on the schedule for rehearsal the next day, and like I come in the next day, and they're like, "It's completely up to you. What do you want to do?" And I said, "Let's take it down so that I can be calm and everything else can be good. Take it down. We open. We're great." Uh, a month, two months later, <clears throat> the creatives are coming back into town to check on us. Now, this whole time I'm working with the voice teacher, sometimes the voice teacher forgets to transpose the song. And I sing it, and I'm fine. Like, we'll play, and then he goes, oh, damn, I forgot to take it down. So we're learning. It's a mental issue. It's if I know it, then I start to shut down. If I don't, then I'm fine. The creatives get back into town. They're like, we really think you're sounding great and everything. We want to take it back up a half a step. I said, fine but don't tell me when you do it. And they were like, uh, all right, we'll figure out how to tell the cast without telling you. Um, and like, of course, every night that week, that week, I was like, oh, it feels higher, it feels higher. 
So they changed it on a Thursday. I sang it. It sounded great. And the whole cast backstage gave up the loudest cheer from me at the end of the song. <laughs> I get emotional about it to this day because they were so happy for me. My understudies never tried to undercut me or take my job. They were like, look, I, I drink this kind of tea when my throat's on it because they were like, we don't want to go on. So you, you know, and they, like, it was just a very, very loving experience, but I learned that it was a mental thing. And once I, once that happened and I was like, Fine. It's so interesting how you could be terrorized for, by a note. You know, it's a, it's a fascinating thing about just art and, you know, our craft. You know, and then the other beautiful thing that you just said about, you know, our community and how supportive our community really is, because, you know, we have a bad rep, yeah. <laughs> you know, we have a we have a, you know, backstabbing rep because those are the good stories. But truthfully, these these sorts of support stories, I hear more than the other. And I've never uh, experienced that, anything other. Yeah. Yeah, no. Me either. You know, it's always people are always there to make you want you to do your best. You know, like, and I think that's that's the beauty of our sort of little rarefied community. Um, so let's just talk a little bit about. I'm curious about because so you've been you've done a lot of amazing shows, and so um, and you've originated roles uh, and you've replaced other than the Lion King. And so, like, what is the difference of that for you? Because you know, you've you've created some great parts, and also like, well, you stepped in on you know the, you were the first Burr replacement in Hamilton, which was a huge show at a time with an iconic performance, but then you went in and made it your own. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And so like, what, what, how, how, what's that process? What's the difference in, uh, you know, when you're creating as opposed to replacing and having to recreate in a way? Well, I mean, I have created more than I've replaced. I've only replaced in, um, in, uh, excuse me. I've only replaced in, Rent and in uh, Hamilton, because um, at least in Lion King, I got to we did create that company from scratch. So I don't. Oh uh, yeah, I don't <laughs> right. You were like rehearsing with a company that had done it a year. Right. Exactly. Right. So um, you know the the I, the difference for me is really only in kind of in how I think of it beforehand. Um, so you so, didn't get a full rehearsal process like in Rent and Hamilton. Like you don't get. Of a four, you have to like do the sort of no. I got learn it. I got five days for rent, and uh, Hamilton. I mean, no, they took their time. Like I had a, like a full uh, four weeks or whatever, but it was like it's in a blank room with the uh, the you know the 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 uh, associate the dance captain playing seven other people. And, and they're describing, okay, now the, the floor is rotating, so walk over here, but you're not actually walking. Oh, they didn't even have a fake turntable for you. A fake turntable. Oh. <laughs> you know, so, so that that is a process. So you're in a room for a day, you know. Um, and also for that one, because I did have a limited period of time, I didn't get to prep for that one the way I usually do. With original roles, I could do a bunch of research and I do all these yeah, things. Yeah, totally, but, totally. But, you know, for Rent, for example, I went into the off-Broadway company um, and, you know, they gave me some packets of things to read about the time. But like I said, I went in like a week. So now I knew the show vocally, which was good. I just had to learn it physically. Um, and that was a real, I'd always wanted to play that role. It was always a real dream for me. And, you know, as much as I, 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 I had seen the show a number of times, I'd listened to Jesse sing it. Um, you know, for me, automatically, my brain, when, I, when I, I attach to something, particularly when the material is good, when there's life in the material, my brain automatically starts to do things. Right. I start to have other ideas. Um, I'm always thinking about the piece as a whole and the characters, how he operates in it, the nature of the piece. Um, and, and so... <clears throat> I think that's your producer, your producer head there too, which we'll talk about in a minute. But yeah, I think it, it extrapolates to that. But it's it's all about again when you enter it. How, how does this thing? You I need to understand how this thing operates best, so that I can understand how to operate best with it, how to optimize it, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so we're, with rent, you know, uh, I I also always say, even on original shows, uh, you know, I sometimes I sing the notes. And sometimes I sing the notes ambitions. And so, 
you know, when choices come to me that are affected by the emotionality of the process, I allow myself to go there. And it tends to create new things while still holding on to the brilliant things. I'm not afraid to steal from my colleagues. So once you've discovered a thing, if that's the right thing, then I'm going to live in that place honestly, because that's the place. So there are things from like Michael McElroy and like Jesse, you know, that, that ended up in my, in my Collins and my Burr. There are uh, things that, that Leslie had found in that text that were in my Burr. But, you know, again, for my Burr, I didn't get, have a lot of time to do a bunch of research. Uh, I read a couple things on Burr that I could, but for the most part, it became about the arena that Lynn had created and the, the narrative arc of watching a person in Burr's position trying to find his way through challenging circumstances and just being honest about that portrayal. Um, and also, yeah, I'm a very different performer. What's interesting is that, so initially I was like, to learn that one, to listen to that soundtrack by Rowe. Because so again, it's like, we're going to hell on, learn it, and then I can take it apart and play with it. Um, for example, when I when I did uh, I did I did, did a show about the life of Ray Charles in Pasadena years ago. Eighteen songs in the show. I learned how to sing every single show, song by rote. All the growls, all the the specific ones he did, so I could sing exactly like the record, so that I understood the palette, so that I could then deconstruct it and do different things, but they would still be honest and they would be what he Ray would do. So the, the same thing kind of happened with Burr. Like once I learned the the piece that Lynn had created. Then it became about this person's journey through it. And what was lovely about that is that I could, that piece had a lot of love, so I could be, I could take Bird through many colors. He could be proud, he could be uh, broken, he could be ashamed, he could, he could be, there could be any number of elements within him that would allow him to arrive at the place he find, finds himself. Um, and, I, and, I, and I appreciated that journey, but that is, you know, Harpo, for example, you know, we went down to Atlanta and we only had a first act. And, um, and you know, they wrote the second act on us when we were down there. So, oh my God. And that was the, that was the color purple. In, in, you did it in Atlanta before you did it in New York, an out of town tryout, I guess you're saying. At the Alliance Theater. The um, Alliance Theater. Oh my God. Norma, uh, Norma she, yeah, she threw out the, uh, she threw out the second act when we went down there and just kind of re, figured it out based on the actors as we were down there and our, and our relationships really amongst each other as they developed and and really found that piece it was um you know so that was a very different exploration shuffle along wildly different you know that was that was a wild show that was like a really interesting ragged crazy show which i thought was really i enjoyed everybody and i saw that and i enjoyed everybody in it like the people that i've seen over and over again like the audras and the and the the brian stokes better in that show than i have ever enjoyed them because there was something about the ragged nature of that that i thought really brought out the best in everybody i mean i wasn't as familiar with you but it was where i became a fan of yours i think i told you that before <laughs> I uh, know that that show was like just as a again like you said I I've, I've been fortunate to create a number of shows and that creative process was was wildly unique and 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 marvelous to be a part of um, um, but you know it contrasted wildly with Scottsboro Boys you know it's just such a very but in each because I play a real person in each of those shows they're biographical shows. Those are about like, you know, I read all the biographies and autobiographies and I read up about the time and I um, really focused on putting myself in a position that I personally and fortunately have never been in. But really that that position of being bursting with potential and, 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 and life and bursting with possibility and being obstructed by social and systemic uh, 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 obstacles that had nothing to do with who you are as a person, how you operate in the world. You know, um, people like the Scottsboro Boys and, and Haywood Patterson and their imprisonment and UB and, and Noble and these, these artists who fight to achieve a thing and then never get the, the, the but then are forgotten. UB got to, UB got to ride though. 
<clears throat> well, it's interesting that you're saying that because I don't know why, but I heard a little bit of a similarity, emotional similarity, not a showbiz similarity, but an emotional similarity in the character that you're playing in our show. Very much. You know what I mean? Like that there's a, so is this, a, I wonder, is this something that attracts you? You know what I mean? Like, I wonder, like, it's because it is complicated and it, it, they, the, the stories are complicated. You know, I always think of our, I look at our guy, you know, our, our Max, the character that you play with us. And, you know, to me, it's the most complicated character I've ever, I've ever seen. And it almost feels like you're, you're, you know, all of these other things that you did before uh, got you ready for it. But let's talk a little bit about it just because it's the thing that we're working on together. And, um, uh, and that character. So one, I mean, people have heard me talk about this a million times, but let's hear your perspective on what the story is about and like what, you know, and what the experience thus far has been for you and what you've learned and because you've stuck it out. I mean, we've been on, we've been on this several, many years, it seems already. So, you you know, you've stuck it out as, as I have. And um, long, uh, relative to, to the time it takes to put shows up, this has been a, you all have been fairly five efficient. years, five years. Okay. Yeah, okay, okay. But again, you're talking about your... Oh, well, because I, right. You've been on it like three years, right? Two. Maybe. Two. Is that it, really? Oh, shoot. So my journey has been... I keep thinking that you've been there from the very beginning. Maybe it's just a subliminal thing. But yeah, you're right. I've been doing it for five years, and you've been doing it for two years. So it's short for you, but it yeah. seems forever for me. But, uh, I mean, all, all wonderful forever. But um, anyway, so talk a little bit about your perspective on this show and like what drew you to it uh, other than me, but like what drew you to it and what made you want to go on the journey of this very complex and controversial character? Um, well, I agreed to do the, the initial reading based on the people involved. So, you know, Jeffrey <clears throat> Seller, one of our producers, uh, um, Tariq, and John Ridley, you know, I was, I was like, all right, well, let me, and it was based on a prior text. I was like, and I read the synopsis and I was like, all right, well, I'm a, it's, a, it's a week of my time. I'm going to, yeah, I'll do it. Um, and then I went, you know, and I read the book by George Schuyler, whom I, whom I found to be a very fascinating individual when I, when I started to read up on him in, in general, you know, uh, uh, sociopolitical journalist in the 1930s, you know, a uh, uh, black man in an interracial relationship, writing very controversial uh, documents, you know, publications starting in, you know, extreme left wing socialist publications and then finding himself writing for right wing publications at the end. Uh, you know, uh, the, the, his famous po uh, famous uh, essay, The Negro Art Pokem, which uh, denounces the, uh, the, the, the existence of or the legitimacy of uh, any thing that is inherently African American and art and literature, etc., postulating the thesis that um, because uh, African Americans are 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 you know, born into, educated in European systems, then everything they create inherently must be European. <clears throat> uh, you know, just very interesting uh, uh, perspectives. But you know, when I read this book, I thought it was fascinating because. You know, uh, and I'm sure you talked at nauseum about it, but you know, it's a it's a this, this fictional story of uh, 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 a, a Howard University graduate who is a scientist who uh, researches the skin disease of vitiligo and discovers how to accelerate the process to the point where, as advertised, he can transform any individual from their Negro form into the form indistinguishable from any Caucasoid or Caucasian. <clears throat> and you know, he hangs up a shingle calls it Black No More Incorporated. And it, it, for me, it's always that, you know, he says to any to any shoe black, any Pullman, any char woman, you know, the, the obstacles to all your dreams in this country can be removed. I can, I can remove the, the shackles and the stain in your race so that all your dreams can be true. Because the whole premise is that, you know, there, there are all these people with all this potential, but society and circumstances won't let them through simply because of how they see the color of their skin. Um, and it, I thought I was, uh, you know, and then to explore uh, just from a, a macro social political level, all the fallout, the fallout in Harlem amongst the black community, the fallout in the South amongst the white community as this thing begins to spread, the fallout between um, poor white Southerners and rich white Southerners, the fallout between uh, uh, um, um, kind of an intellectual 
of Harlemites, black in the black community, and uh, you know, just the, the regular members of the black community who are just trying to find a way through. Uh, the 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 analysis of the, the political construct and how money weighs into each, and you just you know really essentially the book takes the construct of race in this country and indicts every single group's complicity in it, and and it and and he does it in a very searing fashion um, that is so very uh, kind of present. It could be a common, it could be a modern day commentary. And so just the ideas I thought were, were fantastic. And then once we got into the room, I thought that the the, the, the work and the direction that, that the three of you had taken it in, there was already some, you know, very brilliant, brilliant um, creations in the offing. Um, and, you know, because of the quality of the work you were producing and also the importance of, I think, this level of uh, of analysis of the the racial and patriarchal structures in our country, uh, I, I I think is of great value and but also challenging to navigate in this space. You know, as I talk to people about our workshop and, and stuff in the process, I'm like, you know, you gotta understand, like, it's 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 we're, we're creating a, a new language. It's both a satire and a drama. It's you're creating a new a theatrical language that has to make sense to communicate the material, but also has to be engaging enough for the material to get across. That also has to, you know, it's, there, there are, and you're also, if you're making a commentary on these things, which play on the, the most intricate sensitivities of all of us, black, white, in between the spectrum, then we have to be, you know, like how we find our way to the right, to what we're trying to say. I want to be a part of that conversation. And I, I felt that I do have the ability to contribute positively to it, so that that has always been my desire to engage and and ask questions and 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 be a part. And I think that the piece has the potential to be a masterpiece. Um, and I, you know, I'm I'm excited about potential. <clears throat> yeah, me too. Me too. Yeah, you said it all. Yeah. What's that? Did I talk a lot? I apologize. Oh, no, it's all interesting. I you know I have to tell one thing I forgot to say that, of course, I, I heard one minute before that I was supposed to say is that this week um, we're taking, uh, we're, if we have time at the end, we're going to take some questions. So if you guys out there have any questions for Brandon, you could type it in. And if we have time, we will take some of them. Um, anyway, back to back to our, uh, our thing. Um, yeah, no, I, I feel that way too. You know, I've learned so much about participating in humanity just from working on this project with everybody. Mm -hmm. And, um, and uh, so I think, you know, and in, in my career that's, you know, longer than yours, I, I haven't experienced that often, you know, um, and there's something about this show that, well, of course, it was particularly heartbreaking to have to put off. But, you know, like in my discussions with John and Tariq, even, you know, we talk about, you know, how this show will, you know, unfortunately may never be dated. You know what I mean? If anything, the conversation within it keeps keeps growing and keeps becoming deeper and more important. And I think people are, in, in a way, everything that's happening in the world right now, um, you know, as far as civil rights and all, all, all the things that are that people are really talking about and the conversations that are happening in our community even, are making people, in a way, more ready for this show. Yeah, no, I'm Absolutely. And I mean, look, the, the, the material itself is almost 100 years old uh, and still very, very, uh, you know, very, very uh, current. Yeah, there was I can't remember the book, but there was somebody sent me a, a in, in like the New York Times book review a couple of weeks ago. There was a mention of Black No More in a review of uh, another book. Um, and it was, you know, it was similar that it's it's such an old story, but how potent. How, 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 it's, how its potency has grown and grown. And I think that, you know, the writers, you know, Tariq and John really, really went there. And, you know, it's funny when you were describing all the things in the book, I was doing my own mental checklist, like, yeah, that's in the show, that's in the show, we covered that in the show, we hit that in the show. But I feel like all of the things that you said, we, we really have done a good job of, you know, bringing, you know, um, theatrical emotion to all of those those sorts of things. And so in a way, it does seem like a drama, even though it's a satire. Right. <laughs> you know, which is, I think that was fun. That was a fun discovery in the last workshop. Very real. It's a satire about very real and serious things, you know? 
And it's a satire in which people feel very real things and express very real things. I'm interested because, you know, the, it seems like just because of everything that's happening in the world right now, that the world is like looking for sincerity, that there's a sincere sort of thing, that satire is like scary. You know, um, I, what, have you heard anything? Have, have you ever thought about that? Like, because there's this notion that satire is, can be mean and we are, we are trying to, um, we are trying to um, uh, be nice or be respectful, you know I what mean, I mean? So like, what do you well, think of that? And like the movement in there? Shades, I think to everything. Um, but I, I would actually say, I would say, you know, actually the the pivot to make is probably that our show isn't a satire, but our show uses satire um, as part of its language to tell our story. So whatever our show actually is, you know, we certainly use satire, but I, but our, our show is but being satire, using satire does not um, strip, uh, remove honesty, does not remove uh, you know the, the the avenues for real emotional exchange. I mean, you know, like well, that's the way I look at it. Like to me, like the 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 result is satire, but the experience doesn't feel satiric. Do you know what I mean? The the experience, like I'm moved by it every time I I get into it, like I'm so moved, you know, by it. And I think that. Yeah, I mean, these kids, that criticism can't be leveled against our show. I think mm. the communal call is just for things that aren't surface entertainment, for things that are of substance, things that speak to truth, things that speak to real, you know, human connection. I think that that is what the call is for, but that can take on any number of, of, of languages and forms, I think, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and and dealing in satire, particularly for us. I mean, our, our show is very, our show is, is a hybrid of things, but it is very, very, very grounded, um, very emotionally sincere. Um, and whilst our circumstances are extremely heightened as, as they always are in theater, our emotional exchange is not. Yeah, that's what I, I mean, I feel like we've been, yeah, from the very beginning, that's what we talked about you know, sort of just ignoring the satire and ignoring that, you know, and it's funny because some of the choices that we made just in its, in physicalizing it, I don't want to give anything away, but some of the choices that we made in physicalizing it, I think, you know, uh, sort of help with that. What's interesting is, look, the, the things we deal with in the show are very real, very, you know, serious, and also patently absurd, you know? Oh, it's like you know both the even in our in our in how we do the show not give anything away we 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 walk into the absurdity of the concepts that we're dealing with right that well, the con yeah mm -hmm. magically become this and then suddenly the world is different and you know it's like and and I think that that is also a thing that is at play in reality um, racism and preju racial prejudice is absurd. And it's particularly absurd the lengths to which people, the cognitive dissonance required to adhere to it and to, and to pull it to its nth conclusion, almost to the point where it is is it, it becomes laughable to people. Like it's and there's a great and I'm gonna have to memorize it, but there's a great James Baldwin quote where he talks about how Black Americans um, <clears throat> see uh, see white America almost to their see they all, uh, see them almost. Um, you know, and in and, and, and how we see them almost to their detriment as as people who are who, who some of the people who believe in this contract are people who are willing to believe the own illusions that they tell about themselves. And, you know, the absurdity of these level of beliefs are, you know, a, a, a black Americans can find almost, almost laughable, almost to be the conceit of children who want to adhere to those those racial stereotypes. But in viewing it that way, because it, it, it has very real consequences in viewing it that way it's almost to your detriment right but it's commenting on mm -hmm. the absurdity of you know the movie school ties brendan fraser mm -hmm. the absurdity of being best friends with somebody for six months to a year and then discovering that they're jewish and wilding out it's just like <laughs> what who that the absurdity it's almost laughable if it weren't so serious <clears throat>
Yeah, that's right. I guess that's an interesting thing. It'd be laughable if it wasn't so serious. So what, you know, what are your feelings around everything? Of course, I know what your feelings are because we talk, but I think people will be interested to know what your feelings are around, um, you know, everything that's happening, not just in the theater, but in the world around race, but, in, but, but mostly in the theater, because we're talking to a theater loving crowd right now. And, you know, you, you really, um, you said something to me that really woke me up and that woke me up, but it was such an interesting sort of thing. And it really grounded for me. And I hear your voice in my head whenever I'm, because, you know, thinking about, about, you know, race in the theater and how I could do better and all those things. And you had said to me, uh, you and Warren, your, your producing partner, had said, um, don't, it's not about emotion, it's about numbers. <laughs> You know, and I, and like, I, I keep, you know, I keep from, and, and that's a very interesting sort of, it really woke me up. And, you know, like, and I, when you, when you talk to me about that, so talk a little, I mean, you don't have to talk about that, but I, I, I think everybody that's listening would be interested. You're, you're, a, you're a leader in our community. You're a black man. And I think everybody would be very interested to know what you're thinking. Well, I mean, to that, to that point you're talking about it, it just, it just came from the standpoint of approaching, because we've had these kinds of, conversations uh, uh, for a while, right, in many different forms, but it comes from the standpoint of approaching the conversation from, from a point of like, your, your, your feelings mean something, but they don't matter unless they are reflected in action and unless that action is reflected in the landscape. And if you are going to say and project a certain ethos, if you are going to champion yourself and your community as a certain thing, then the details have to reflect that. And if they don't, you just have to be honest about that. So like that, that's, a, that's an issue separate from your feelings. So mm -hmm. as, a, as a theater company or, you know, if you project that you're about a certain kind of work from diverse bodies of artists, for about representing voices and so and so, and then your boards are 95% white or male or homogenous in some sort of way that's limiting the voice and the mission that you're projecting, well, that is the reflection, not how you feel about what's going on. It's, it's like, all right, but what are we actually doing? And then what are the mechanisms that are preventing these things from taking place if everybody really feels this way? Because the data does not seem to reflect what everybody is saying that they're feeling. And so we can, so in that case, it's like, all right, nobody has to call anybody a liar or disingenuous. It's wonderful that you all feel that way. But how does that manifest in the world and are you really willing to go to the lengths to alter that so that you can represent what you say you want to represent and if not that's fine but you but then you have to be own who you're deciding to be right i think that that becomes that becomes a question particularly amongst our community because our community is very loud about championing um diversity and inclusion and equity and and supporting people who are not supported and represented and when you and, and that has to be more than a surface thing, right? That has to be about more than feelings. Right. I think that, you know, like that's what I, you know, like, yeah, exactly. It's put the feelings away and get to work. I think well, that's the. Uh, you can deal with the feelings, but it has to be about more than feelings. And it, we, feelings can't be all we're talking about because then right. they won't, right? You know, and I, I, think, I think that that's, that's what it comes down to. And you're you're working. I know you're on the advisory board of like Black Theater United, and I know that there's a million now uh, sort of break off groups, you know, around this. But like, talk a little bit about that group because you seem to have aligned yourself uh, in a certain way with that group. And I would be interested to know like what are they doing? Like what you know, what action or what are their you know where where do they see things going? And and uh, I mean, I know it, but I want you to tell everybody about it. Uh, well, you know, Black Theater United um, is really a, a collection of, 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 you know, some of the most experienced, I think, and, and prominent members of our theater community, both performers and um, and backstage, stage managers, writers, directors. Of it. And, you know, the, in coming together and, and recognizing the, the issues at play at the time, I, I think the group wanted, recognized uh, a value in creating a centralized base for um, black theater uh, professionals and aspiring theater professionals to come together, almost like a, you know, like a, a black student union in, in a college or like a student union to come together to have a home base to discuss the issues that happen within the community, but also to have, um, uh, to also be able to organize, um, not just represent issues within the community, but 
at large in our, within our country and our world. It's like, you know, a lot, a lot of us have political uh, and, and feelings and feelings about social justice issues and are maybe participating in our own uh, campaigns or, 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 or advocating here or there, but what can we do if we can organize as a coordinated block? And so if you can create a coordinated block of theater professionals that can speak to the issues that are happening within the community throughout the country, but also can organize to advocate for uh, uh, black communities throughout the country and communities of color um, and work with organizations that want to advocate for that and intersectionality between them and other organizations, then that is the kind of entity that um, we felt there was a, a, a maybe a need for in this space and that we as a collective had the resources and the network to form. And also looking at the other kind of, you know, uh, other groups that are breaking off, that are not are breaking off, that are forming to address different issues within our community, uh, we felt like this could be a valuable resource. Um, I think it's one of those things, you know, I, I myself have a nonprofit and we're engaged in a, a We Are The Vote initiative, you know, registering and educating, galvanizing voters. And really, you know, you, you can't underestimate the, uh, the power of a coordinated message, um, of coordinated action. And that's largely what you know what we talk about. It's about not just about voting, but voting in the interest of the collective, recognizing the power of your collective voice and vote. And so, you know, I think Black Theater United is really about that, uniting and cool and connecting groups to have these conversations and further these these discussions. Yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot to talk about. It's a lot to it's a lot to think about. It's so much. It's it, it's incredible that all of these discussions are happening, and now uh, there's a lot of time for people to reflect on them because everybody's sitting around. Absolutely. So I think that's a. I think it's good. I'd be interested. I'm so curious to see how we are, how we reemerge. But I know a lot of people are doing a lot of work. So hopefully, you know, things will move in the right direction by the time we. Uh, how we reemerge will be very interesting. Um, I think so. It's in many ways, but yes. You know, it's one of, I've talked about this with people like you always have to recognize the levels to social movements and the and the levers to social change. And there can oftentimes be large explosions of energy in a certain direction. In a positive direction that is celebrated. There are things happening. There are companies supporting things. They are great. We're integrating things. But you have to do the ground foundational level of organizing, not just taking those gains for granted, but organizing around them and continuing to support to secure uh, economic and political knowledge and gains that will allow that progress to continue and not revert. <clears throat> uh, you know, it's like what is I talk to my friends about South Africa a lot and the, 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 the joy at the fall of apartheid in 94 where at that time it's something like uh, 3% of the population owned 95% of the land, right? And then now we're like 25, 30 years later, still like 8% of the population owns 85% of the land, right? And it's so it's like there was a, a social celebration, but infrastructurally, economically and politically, the levers were no, not manipulated to create an actual sustainable change. And so... I think we have to think about that, you know, in our country as we have these social justice conversations. And I think we also have to think about it within our community. It's like, all right, well, we're having conversations about things that we feel are important. Um, and that is a victory in and of itself. But how do we actually put in place the mechanisms to make sure that we transform? Right. Right. A lot to think about. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's it, we're getting close, but I want to talk. I just want to talk a little bit about just because your producing career is so um, is so interesting to me, and you know the way you know you have your own production company and a partner, and how, how, like how did that interest? How did that all happen? Like how did that? How did you go? You know, I love most. I love people who do, do lots of different things, and you're one of them. So how did you get your mind in wanting to be a producer, uh, a commercial producer, by the way? The desire for control, Scott. Yeah, but no, I get it. I've been doing it my whole life. <laughs> no, uh, I mean it's just it was a, it was a natural progression. You know, as I tell people, it's like you go from as an actor, you go from wanting to understand your lines 
and your notes so that you can affect the scene and the song the best. And then you go from wanting to understand the scenes and the act so you can understand and manipulate the text, the, the, the show as a whole, the best. And then you're always trying to accomplish a thing and you're suddenly running into, well, I can't do it because this light's here or I need this. What are the tools that will help me communicate what I'm trying to communicate to the audience? And so you start thinking more about, more about using the tools that theater provides. And as you are weighing pros and cons and possibilities, you're learning why things can and cannot happen as you build new shows. I mean, that, that's the basis for my, my knowledge of and interest in. And then it's really the process of building Motown the musical that really mm. aged for me. I mean, I got brought into that process very early on by one of my mentors, Charles Randolph Wright, the director. You know, he, mm-hmm. called, he called me the day he got the job <clears throat> after he left Barry Gordy's house. Um, and, you know, from that day, working with him, we, you know, building the show. That's how I'm my, my partner in my production company, Warren Adams, is the choreographer of, of Motown the Musical. I but brought, you, did you meet on that show or did you meet at, before that show? I had met Warren through uh, the original Squeak in the Color Purple, Cresha Marcano. They oh, were close friends because she started out as a modern dancer and that's where Warren came from. You know, when he first came from South Africa and, and London, he was dancing here for Donald Byrd. Uh, you know, living in Penn Station, and then he and Krisha, she and he ended up crashing with Krisha, and they became close friends. And to this day, Warren's brother and wife and baby live in that same apartment in Queens that Krisha first took Warren into. Um, but we uh, that I'd known him, and we had you know worked on things, and I got you know you spent time before that. But it was when I was working on Motown and recognizing both the needs for the show and the needs of the creative team, and also recognizing that as as fully included in all of the creative discussions and growth of the show as I was initially, I knew as we got further into the process of rehearsals and things, they wouldn't include me in those meetings as much. And so I wanted somebody in there who would, and also who would be able to help everybody be their best self to make the show the best thing it could possibly be. So that's how I got Warren involved uh, to the, chore- the choreography team. And really Warren and I in that show, working to support Charles, working to support Barry, uh, you know, would have conversations about, all right, well, like these things are happening. Do you think these things make sense and these things don't? So, all right, you talk to Charles about this and I'll talk to Barry about this. And then we'll go, you know, say, and then we'll get Belize to you to talk to him about that. You know, <laughs> it was the, you know, and after going through that kind of process and recognizing both, it's like the closer you get to the uh, to the seat of influence or decision making power, uh, it's almost like the more frustrating it can be. Because you know you can fight and you get to you get to make your arguments, you get to build the things, and then somebody's like, "Yeah, but we're not going to do that." So, mm-hmm. so you 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 know, it, it was both. Uh, it was twofold. It was we feel confident that we can be we can build shows, but also, I uh, you know, I'm going to spend. I'm gonna get paid for my creative material for the next 365 days that I'm on this contract. But I have a lot of stuff in this show that I that is gonna to continue to generate income for other people for years to come, and I'm not gonna have any part of that. So I wanna put myself in a position to be able to have some ownership and investment of that creative material, that creative investment. But I also like, I'm talented, I'm smart, but I'm not the greatest anything in the world. Same thing with Warren. He's t- but but I've been fortunate enough to be put into certain rooms to to get opportunities, to meet with people and to f- people find me likable enough to ask me things I want to do, and I know some brilliant people who don't get that as often. And so if I can create a platform where I can bring brilliant people in to do other things, then like, then I want to do that. So those are all of the thoughts and ideas that made us decide, all right, let us hop into this very challenging, absurd world of commercial producing. Yeah, well, you have that company, Rock, uh, Walk, Run, Fly. And so like, I think that you've, you've corporatized, you've, you've made yourself a, you have, you have a company, but like, I, you know, I'm very, I'm, I'm as you know, I'm, I'm very impressed with Warren too. And, um, and you know, I, I'll coyly say that the three of us are cooking up a little quarantine project that we might uh, throw out there, but I, I'm just impressed with your partnership. And I, I, uh, I think it's great. 
I got but, good tooth. I know how to pick them. You do know how to pick them. He really is something. I was so I was impressed. I'm looking forward to getting to know him and your partnership more. Um, anyway, uh, the, you know we're at, sort of at the end. I feel bad because let's take one question. Do you have? Is there one question that uh, we could take? Ah, uh, anything he'd like to share about the experience of TV filming Jesus Jesus Christ Superstar? I purposely left that out, but um, but so now you have to talk about it. Uh, anything I'd like to share about the experience? Uh, look, it was other than you were amazing in it. It was like a great performance. I I loved doing the show because it, it gave me the opportunity to uh, make people feel differently about a character, a person they thought they knew. Uh, that is, I think, the thing that I, I cherish. That's what I cherished about Burr. That's what I think I cherish about performance a lot. A lot of the issues we have in our world and in our, in our, in our interaction is because we, uh, we think specific things about people. Uh, we have a lot of preconceived notions predetermined things. And, and so if you can use art as a mechanism to get people to feel differently about something they think they know, I think that that's important. Um, but, you know, so that that was a, a, a very key thing to me, but also it reinforced how collaborative making art is. <clears throat> television as well. And it was a theater television hybrid, but um, it was a, it was like a, a really wonderful experience because everybody was locked into creating the best piece of art that they could, and like uh, like Lin Manuel said, isn't it wonderful that we're all sitting here on a Sunday evening watching a musical together? That happened. Uh, that, that's a great w way to go out. I will say that you know your likability is is something that you bring to all of your horribly com complicated characters, and I think that's what that's the that's what's so compelling about what you do and the choices that you make. Anyway, I think I have to stop. I could talk to you forever, but we can always hop on the phone later. These people can't, but uh, we can. Um, anyway, anything you'd like to say on the way out, Brandon? Mm. Nah, no, be, be, all. be kind to one another. Amen, amen. All right, my friend, I'll talk to you very soon. And listen, everybody out there, thanks for tuning in. And once again, I'm going to tell you that it would be good if you donated. So uh, anyway, newgroup.org. Anyway, we'll see you soon. We got uh, Natasha Leone on deck next time. And uh, come join us. That's not till September. Oh, God, a couple of weeks off. All right, there you go. All right, well, thanks, everybody. Thank you, my friend Brandon, Victor Dixon. Love you, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Take care. Bye.